everybody and welcome. Thanks so much for joining us here today. Um, so if you'd like to utilize the chat feature right now to tell us where you're calling in from, what organization you're with, what part of the industry you work in, I think that would be great context for us to know who's joining us today. Um, and also a couple of housekeeping items right up front. So feel free to utilize the chat feature during today's presentation for any questions as they occur to you. And then we'll have time at the end of the webinar to address those questions. My name is Emily Hamilton and I'm the Innovation Advocate and Deal Flow Analyst for the Cleveland Water Alliance. I'm here with Katie and Zach joining us from Xylem. And I'm excited to introduce another one of CWA's Innovator Showcase series. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. If you're not already familiar with CWA, we're an economic development nonprofit located in Cleveland. As you can see here on the slide are some of our various um, programmings that we're offering currently. We um, are going to focus primarily on the water technology test beds as that is the, the focus of the Innovator Showcase. It's intended to be a first look at companies with exciting technologies, large or small, looking to trial or demonstrate their technology in a the Lake Erie watershed test bed for IoT. And I'm gonna pause on this particular program for just a moment to explain it further. So some background on that is that our Lake Erie watershed test bed is focused on supporting innovators and technologies intended to be deployed in the natural environment. That might include streams, ponds, open water conditions, um, offshore deployments, uh, etc. We're focused on freshwater environments here in the Great Lakes region as that is our very, very important resource here. And in order to support the trialing and or demonstration of IoT technologies, we've built a telecommunications network to enable those deployments. So what we're looking at here on the screen is Lake Erie as it has appeared through all of history as completely unconnected. And very recently, you can see that CWA has utilized funds from an EPA grant to deploy gateways using LoRaWAN technology, long range, uh, wide area um, coverage, along with Wi-Fi and cellular coverage to create a connectivity across the coastline. The, this is a photograph of our tower climbers who help us deploy these uh, these gateways. And this is a photograph of where we're going as far as coverage across Lake Erie. Um, we're uh, continuing to deploy additional gateways and we plan to cover the entirety of the US side of uh, our Great Lake. This work has enabled us to deploy our own devices that CWA has purchased to track real-time things like weather and water properties, and also provide benchmark data for newer technologies deploying within the test bed. I'd also uh, like to clarify that our test bed supports a range of various technologies all throughout the IoT lifecycle. That includes sensors, automation, cybersecurity, auxiliary technologies like anti-biofouling technologies as well. So that is the process through which this relate this particular iteration of a relationship with Xylem has come to us. And without further ado, I'd like to pass it along to Katie and Zach to talk about the technology that they recently um, have been working on. Thank you. I'll go ahead and share my screen so Zach can get started. Okay. All set, Zach. All right, yeah, thank you. So I'll go ahead and kick things off here. And, and thank you, Emily, for having us. Uh, my name is Zach Henderson. I am the Xylem product manager responsible for YSI's outdoor water quality monitoring instruments. I'm primarily focused on the ExoSond line, and I've been with the company for about six years now. 
So again, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, some of the exciting products we've been working on. So I'll start with a brief background on YSI. Uh, for those that may not be familiar, YSI or Yellow Springs Instruments. It was founded in Yellow Springs, Ohio in 1948. So we're actually celebrating our 75th anniversary this year. So we're really excited about that. Um, we are focused on developing and manufacturing reliable water quality field instruments, sensors that can be uh, used to monitor for extended deployments. And we are continually working on improvements to our products from a long-term reliability standpoint and exp expanding our sensing capabilities. In 2011, the YSI joined Xylem, which enabled us to benefit from technology sharing across Xylem's many brands and has led to some innovative developments, which we'll touch on later. So Xylem, uh, for context, is a leading water technology provider with over 350 global locations, providing solutions for basically all parts of the water cycle. So these solutions include infrastructure and systems for water transport, treatment, and dewatering, as well as measurement and control solutions, including metering, leak management, and analytics. And so YSI falls within Xylem's analytics branch, where you'll find field monitoring solutions for water quality, as well as water quantity and flow. While Xylem and YSI offer industrial and laboratory water quality instruments, Katie and I are focused on the field instrumentation for environmental monitoring. So YSI offers solutions from basic one parameter spot sampling to comprehensive systems with telemetry and cloud data hosting. So for today's discussion, we'll be focused on our multi-parameter continuous monitoring solutions. And that is largely comprised of our ExoSond line. So the ExoSond platform is the flagship product line out of Yellow Springs. These are multi-parameter continuous monitoring instruments that incorporate YSI's cutting edge sensing technology and powerful anti-fouling. Our aim is to provide the most reliable instrumentation for long-term unattended monitoring. So as you know, there are many challenges associated with getting reliable data from the field, whether it is rough conditions or high fouling environments. And our engineers have developed and continue to improve the performance of these instruments. All of our exosensors, as well as the exoson bulkhead are built with titanium. And you'll notice the large uh, wiper in the center of the payload, which keeps the sensor faces clean during months of deployment. This is important to minimize the interference associated with fouling, which can threaten data quality. So as you can see, we offer a wide range of water quality sensors for measuring a variety of parameters. And we'll take some time today to focus specifically on our UV nitrate sensor. which we've named the Exo Nitro LED, as the sensor uses UV LED technology. So the goal with this sensor was to improve our nitrate monitoring capabilities in the field. We offer a nitrate ion selective electrode or ISE. However, ISEs have limited performance in the field. Uh, they are susceptible to drift and limited accuracy. We, uh, with the Nitro LED, um, we were able to make significant improvements to drift and improve the accuracy over the ISE. We also wanted something that could actually fit in our EXO platform. There are other optical nitrate sensors available, but most of these are very large, expensive, and power hungry. With, what sets the Nitro LED apart is its low power consumption, relatively low cost, and its small form factor all of which enable it to be easily added to the exosensor payload. It's compatible with, ex with the existing central wiper. However, there is a new brush head that is uh, available to help clean the sensing window of the NitroLED sensor. So with NitroLED, again, we aim to provide the most accessible UV nitrate sensor for long-term nitrate monitoring. And at this point, I wanna hand it over to Katie to kind of dig into this a little bit more. Thank you, Zach. So let's back up a little bit and talk about why we measure nitrate in water. 
And I'm sure all of you are familiar with this, but there's issues of eutrophication of surface water. We know increased nutrient loads from human activities, especially industry and agriculture, feed algal blooms. And large blooms can block sunlight, and as they die off, it can lead to anoxic conditions, which cause dead zones and fish kills. And certain algae can release toxins into the water column. And the effects of excess nutrients can cause concerns for both human health and the environment, and not to mention can have huge economical impacts. So now let's talk about the design of the NitroLED sensor. So it has two LED lights emitted from the light source, one at 235 nanometers and one at 275 nanometers. Um, and just a note for safety, you don't want to look into the LEDs or touch in the sensing window when the sensor is powered um, because it is UV light. Um, and then there's the 10 millimeter optical path link, which allows for the specialized wiper brush to pass through and clean the sensor face. Um, on the other side of the path length is the measurement photodiode that detects the light that has passed through the sample. And then in the body of the sensor are the brains that take the raw absorbent signal and apply it to internal algorithms that calculate nitrate concentration. Um, the NitroLED is an EXO smart sensor, so it stores its calibration data and will assist you with smart QC throughout the calibration process. So like I said, the NitroLED has an internal algorithm which uses two main equations to calculate nitrate absorbance. The total absorbance at the 235 nanometer wavelength is the sum of absorbance of nitrate, turbidity, and natural organic matter, or NOM. And then the second equation for the 275 nanometer wavelength is the sum of absorbance due to turbidity and NOM at that wavelength. The NitroLED is using live readings from the EXO turbidity sensor, so you need one installed in your SONS. And when we factor out um, turbidity and NOM absorbances from the second calculation, we are able to calculate the nitrate absorbance. So let's talk uh, more about the sensor and how it makes turbidity corrections. Um, again, NitroLED relies on the readings for turbidity from the exoturbidity sensor. Um, as you can see in the graph here, different sediment types have different absorbance curves. Depending what sediment type you have at your site, it can have very different effects on the sensor. Um, we program default corrections in the sensor according to the Kaolin curve. That's the yellow line in the graph. Uh, since it's a common sediment type, if the sediment type in your body of water is significantly different from Kaolin, such as Elliott silt loam, which is the green line in the graph, uh, there would be a large difference in how the algorithm accounts for turbidity absorbance. So it's possible and likely that the default corrections won't be consistent with your actual environmental conditions and may cause your nitrate values to be either overcorrected or undercorrected for turbidity interferences. That being said, this is what makes the NitroLED unique. Its performance can be optimized for the species of turbidity present at your site using a site-specific correction, which adjusts the internal algorithm and yields more accurate nitrate data. And similarly, the absorbance of NOM is different at each site. Uh, the yellow line in the graph here is an example of a NOM absorbance curve. The blue line represents the absorbance at 235 nanometers and the pink at 275 nanometers. Um, we measure NOM at the two points and then the correlation between the two is the NOM coefficient. So we built in a default NOM coefficient in the NitroLED algorithm to give a baseline NOM correction. Um, however, since NOM species can have very different absorbance curves, this coefficient can, can change. Uh, like with turbidity, the site-specific correction will allow you to adjust the NOM coefficient to fit the specific environmental conditions and types of interferences at your site. So this graph here is an example of how the NitroLED sensor compares to another sensor during a storm event. This data was collected during our beta testing and before the sensor was released. Um, NitroLED data is in purple 
And the other sensor we tested against for the comparison study is in orange. And as Zach mentioned, nitrate sensors can be more expensive, power hungry, lack anti-fouling, and they can come in a different platform type other than being able to integrate into a sond. Um, and so the blue line shows turbidity from the exoturbidity sensor. And during the storm event in the middle here, you can see the event reached approximately 375 FNU. Um, overall, we can see the sensors trended very well together. During the high turbidity event, the nitrolide overcorrected the nitrate data, resulting in that jump you see, while the other sensor was clogged up due to sediment fouling. And it's important to note that nitrolide has a limit to the total absorbance it can read at once. So, so events with turbidity that are above 300 FNU can overwhelm the sensor. But as the water receded, the nitrolide data returned to normal because of the anti-fouling wiper that kept the sensors clean. While the other sensor had um, some of that noisy data you can see after the events and it needed to be, uh, it needed a cleaning visit to put it back on track. But again, overall, we're really happy to see that uh, this beta test showed a good trend between nitrolide and the other nitrate sensor data. So last year we set out to collect more nitrate, uh, nitrolide data. Uh, this was made really convenient through our participation with the Cleveland Water Alliance test bed. Uh, we worked with Defiance Water Treatment Plants and Limnotech in Ohio to deploy a nitrolide sensor on an existing XO2 deployment uh, located in the Defiance Water Pump House. And that's on the Maumee River, just upstream of a confluence. Um, we were able to collect data from June through October of 2022 alongside the Green Eyes New Lab uh, Wet Chemistry Nutrient Analyzer, which you can kind of see behind Kyle's head in that picture. Um, it was really cool to have the Wet Chemistry Analyzer as a comparison data set against the nitrolead. Um, and I performed a calibration and a site-specific correction on the nitrolead before the deployment, and then I allowed it to collect sensor data um, throughout the summer. So here's a graph of the nitrate data from both the exo nitrolead and the new lab throughout the deployment. Um, the nitrolead data is in purple and the new lab data is in orange. Um, first you might notice there's some data gaps in the new lab data. And this was due to periods of servicing. Um, and both devices experienced some bouts of noisiness at different points in the deployment, but overall they trend really well together, uh, both during storm flow and base flow. So I just highlighted a few areas here. And there's largely a less than 0.5 to one milligram per liter variation. Um, it's important to note that during the deployment, I did not return to recalibrate the nitro lead, um, though we do recommend monthly calibration. So to dive a little deeper into the data, we used R programming to generate correlations. Um, and since I did not have complete control of the experimental design, we had to be a little flexible in our data analysis. Um, the nitrate devices were logging at slightly different intervals uh, due to programming differences. Um, and to run any statistical correlations, you need the data points to be collected at the same time. Um, and of those thousands of data points we had throughout those months, only 25 had the same timestamp. Um, however, they still did correlate well by the Spearman's rank test. So to view this correlation even better, we performed an interpolation on the data to infer data between the missing timestamps. Um, and using a, the Pearson's test, the p-value was very significant um, and showed a strong positive relationship, as I expected since the data trended so well together. And then I was curious to look into the relationship of nitrate and turbidity. So I layered the exo turbidity data in blue over the nitrate data. And let's just focus on a couple events. So here we saw a big event and a spike in turbidity around 300 FNU. And this followed with elevated nitrate levels shown by the nitro lead. And it's a similar story for this next event a couple of weeks later where we see a bounce in turbidity and then an increase in nitrate. Um, but I wasn't sure what to expect for the correlation between the parameters since they don't necessarily have a positive 
linear relationship. Um, and there are other periods where the nitrate increases while turbidity decreases. And this can be because during a storm event, um, it's either nutrients washed downstream from agriculture or another input leading to an increase in nitrate or elevated storm flow can also dilute nutrients in water. So as expected, the correlation between turbidity and nitrolate, nitrolate is a complicated one. Um, since we don't always expect them to coincide and every event is a bit different in terms of the type and amount of turbidity present and whether um, nitrate will simultaneously simultaneously increase. Um, however, we did find that the correlation um, was overall positive between the parameters with a significant B value. The graph here breaks this down by month. So six in the legend is June, that's yellow. Um, and you can see a few different positive trends in there representing different, several different uh, storm events. And similarly, I could eyeball a positive trend in July, that's pink, um, gray, August, black, September, and red, November. Um, I just drew a few lines so you can see what I mean. Um, so it's interesting to see how the trends changed by month and appear to have seasonality as the summer progressed to fall. Um, in my opinion, that shows the importance of performing calibrations and site-specific corrections monthly or per event to make sure your sensor is correcting for the different types of turbidity that may be present over the season. And next, let's briefly discuss chlorophyll as it relates to nitrate. So the green line is chlorophyll absorbance data from the exototal algae sensor. And I'll just focus on this one event here in July where we had a spike in nitrate. A few days after the increased nutrients, we saw an increase in chlorophyll, which we might assume correlates to an increase in algal biomass. So this shows an inverse relationship. Whereas nitrate spikes, you have an abundance of nutrients in the water column. And as algae growth increases and uses up the nutrients, chlorophyll absorbance increases and the nitrate decreases. So this is a well-documented relationship between nutrients and algae. Um, and nutrient monitoring is often used for early warning systems and predictive monitoring of trends in harmful algal blooms. So it was great to see this relationship exemplified by the nitrolead and the total algae absorbance data. Um, not surprisingly, we do see a correlation by the Spearman's rank test, though it is rather a set of inverse curves. Again, they're broken down by month. And we see this one over X curve in June, that's yellow, and July, pink, particularly. Um, this relationship appears to change over the season again per month. Um, but this correlation data supports the relationship that we observed in the graphed data. So just to review, um, you can achieve the best possible nitrolead performance and data by implementing the site-specific correction to correct for the specific turbidity and NOM at your site. And again, you'll see even better performance if you prefer, perform corrections seasonally as turbidity and NOM species fluctuate during events. And as we showed with our test bed deployment data, the nitrolid shines in long-term deployments since it offers stable calibrations and it can also benefit from the exo central wiper um, to maintain clean sensor faces even during storm events and continue to give stable data. And since it's part of the exosond, it can plug right into telemeter data sets uh, like we did with um, the deployment site and we're able to view the data on Limnotech's website. And the nitrolead is also a great choice for nutrient monitoring, specifically in freshwater bodies since it's not ideal for salt water. Um, and it can play a role in early warning systems that use monitoring of nutrients to predict HAB events as well as total maximum daily load monitoring for agricultural runoff and larger watershed impacts. So thank you for your attention and thank you to Cleveland Water Alliance, the City of Defiance and Limnotech for their support in the test bed deployments.
Thank you, Katie, and thank you, Zach, um, for this wonderful presentation. I have a couple of questions uh, for you to get started. And then we also have a couple that uh, trickled in during the presentation itself. So my first question for you is um, how important the trialing process prior to the commercial release of this type of device is. and um, if you could get into any details about trialing in saltwater versus freshwater, the weather conditions that are of concern, biofouling, the housing of the sensor, the buoy, anything of that nature would be very helpful. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Katie, I'll take this one if that's okay. Um, so for us, you know, field trialing is critical to the success of the development project. Um, different environments present different challenges. And since our instruments are designed specifically for environmental monitoring, it is extremely important for us to do field trialing, um, typically in the form of alpha and beta tests prior to the release of a product. So um, in addition to internal testing, we do like to partner with external organizations, including local agencies that have unique sites and conditions. Um, this helps us make bigger strides and problem solving earlier on in, in the development process. Uh, so it's great being able to leverage programs like the CWA testbed, for example. Um, speaking specifically on some of the, you know, considerations you mentioned, saltwater, freshwater, weather, all that stuff. Um, we definitely may, need to make sure that the instruments hold up in real world conditions. Um, offshore and saltwater deployments can be particularly harsh on instruments and weather events um, can also be quite stressful. So we need to ensure that the instrument integrity holds up. You know, it doesn't matter how good the sensing technology is if the instrument fails in the real world environment. And so, um, and then for fouling, obviously, um, I stressed the importance earlier of our, you know, central wiper probe that keeps the sensor faces clean during the deployment. So. You know, fouling can lead to, um, you know, compromised data interference that can, you know, affect the data quality during the deployment. So um, we pride ourselves on our instrument durability and reliability. Um, and I think that's what sets YSI and in particular the EXO apart from the competition is that ability to ensure reliable data over the course of the deployment. Um, and then specifically for nitrolide, um, you know, Katie mentioned, uh, and her size is about the effects of different types of turbidity in real world environments. Um, there, during the development of that project, um, we had the sensor deployed in different environments. We also had um, different samples of turbidity types shipped to us so we could test, um, which allowed us to kind of program our internal algorithms in factory cor uh, corrections for that sensor. Um, but I will say, you know, the factory corrections aren't necessarily suitable for all environments. That's why we include the, um, the site-specific correction for users to perform to kind of fine tune the sensor for their environment. Um, and then for the saltwater piece, uh, for nitrolide in particular, we did trial that sensor in saltwater. Um, unfortunately, there were some challenges associated with that. Um, we did see greater interference in those environments for the sensor. Uh, and determined that, you know, a different path length would be required to really optimize the sensor in that environment. So we are still performing some ongoing testing in those marine environments, but we currently do not recommend the nitrolide sensor for use in those environments. So, um, but yeah, those are just some kind of examples there. Uh, I know that was a lot to say that yes, trialing is very important for, for our development. <laughs> Um, and the specifics are very interesting as well. So thank you so much. I want to kind of just piggyback off of that question and ask um, what are, if you can share any of the criteria that Xylem adheres to when they determine when a device is ready for prime time, so to speak. Yeah, well, I mean, so the specific criteria is obviously going to depend on the, you know, type of device or instrument that we're, we're developing, but in general for all um, development projects for, for new products, uh, we put together a cross-functional team, which includes marketing, uh, R&D, manufacturing, and quality to ensure that we're meeting customer requirements, basically. Um, so we work with R&D to develop the product specifications. Uh, we work with the quality department to develop a statistical test plan to ensure those instruments meet the specifications. 
um, manufacturing. You know, we, we work with the manufacturing group um, to run pilot builds, which is kind of like a, a rehearsal for production to make sure, you know, we're ready to launch this thing. Um, so, and we typically use those pilot units then for our um, beta testing in the real world environments. And again, making sure the instruments are ready for prime time, if you will. Mm -hmm. I mean, are there any other considerations that Xylem has before sending a device to market, like in the greater context of the market itself? Uh, yeah, well, that's that's a great question, too, because, um, you know, we do sell these instruments all over the world. So uh, we need to perform compliance testing. That can take a while, actually, unfortunately, but we have to you know, make sure that our instruments are approved um, using approved materials and a pass uh, emissions and communication standards. Um, and these standards can be different for different countries. So again, we work with quality to ensure um, compliance with all of the countries that we sell into. Excellent. And um, if you could share any of the specific benefits and learnings that came directly from the testbed deployment, um, that would be great. Yeah, so I can jump in here since I um, kind of ran that deployment from our side. But um, it was really great because we were able to work with uh, Defiance Water Treatment Plant and Limnotech to deploy the NitroLED at their monitoring site. And we have the benefit of not only work networking with expert users of EXO because they already have their own site, but we also have the benefit of having an established deployment site that has regular maintenance that's already scheduled and their own live data output. Um, and like I showed earlier, the site was a pump house in the treatment plant and it brought water up from the Maumee River. Um, and Limnotech hosts the telemeter data from their site to their online platform. So after I calibrated and installed the NitroLED in their system, not only could I rely on them to make sure the sensors were fully functional with those regular uh, maintenance visits, but I could also access their live data site to check on the performance. Um, and a lot of sites that are you know, available for us to do testing, do not have telemeter, telemeter data. Um, and I don't always have the luxury of setting up deployments close to my home office um, myself. So it was really helpful to me to have that experience with them. Um, not to mention, I can get feedback from our partners working at the site, um, talk to them about their experience. Um, and it's really beneficial to hear that feedback um, on their use of our equipment. Um, and going forward, we definitely want to be utilizing testbed in the future. Um, we continue to work, we want to continue to work with ne the network to harness local experts um, that will help us develop our technology and give us feedback. And um, like we talked about earlier, those like Zach was mentioning, those are really crucial steps in our development process. So um, overall, it was a really really helpful experience for us. And we got a lot of great data from it. Awesome, thank you. Um, my last question before I open it up to the audience questions, which have been trickling in here uh, since the beginning of the presentation is kind of a gimme for uh, you two, but can you share any exciting developments coming up the pipeline for Xylem? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I can speak specifically for uh, my product line on the on the EXO side. Um, uh, right now, um, we're really focused on improving kind of data accessibility. Um, so we, we we put a lot of resources into ensuring like instrument quality and reliability in the field, but making sure it's you know easy to get that important data is also important. So I'm uh, currently working with our team to develop um, mobile apps. So we actually just recently launched a mobile application for Android that will allow. Um, users, EXO users to kind of interface just like they would with a handheld or with the software and configure their instrument, um, download data, actually, you know, log data directly to their mobile device if they want to. Um, so that's that's been uh, that's been really great to kind of get across the finish line. And we're continuously working to improve that. Um, users can perform calibrations with it. Didn't want to forget that piece. But um, right now, the We've launched that on Android right now. We're focusing on um, getting it over on the uh, Apple side, on the iOS for iPhones and iPads. Um, that that's a little bit trickier. That development's a little bit trickier, but we are making good progress on it. Um, 
and hope to have something uh, launched here maybe in the next uh, 12 to 18 months or so. Um, so be, be on the lookout for that. But Android users can, can benefit from that now. So, so that's very exciting. And I, I encourage everybody on this call to, to download it, all Android users on this call to download it and check it out and uh, provide some feedback. You know. Thanks, Zach. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to move into the questions that we received from the audience, the first of which is, how does the Nitro lead compare with the SUNA or S-U-N-A, and do they con perform comparably to your knowledge? Yeah, I can, uh, I can touch on this and Katie, feel free to elaborate more. Um, so, you know, we, we referenced some other nitrate monitors available in the market. Um, the soon is obviously like, you know, has a, has a reputation for being, a, you know, an ext extremely robust nitrate sensor. Um, it uses different technology. It uses kind of like a full lamp technology as its light source versus the nitrolead, you know, how we were able to get it into the form factor um, with the power requirements um, and price point <laughs> that we were aiming for with nitrolead. Um, you know, we had to make some compromises, um, but fortunately, like, you know, through the, um, you know, site-specific correction, we're able to get like pretty comparable results to Asuna. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say the nitrolead is a, a 100% full substitute for Asuna, but it can certainly be used, um, you know, with it to kind of supplement uh, or as like a cost effective option um, for trending very well, very closely to to what the SUNA can can achieve. So, um, yeah. Katie, did you want to add anything to that? No, yeah, I, I think you hit on it. And also, um, yeah, it's really just a while they perform comparably, it's really a balance of, you know, what do you want to focus on for your budget, your um, monitoring needs? If you're already an EXO user, it's easier to you know adopt NitroLED, but we're um, sensitive to how different applications can have different needs for their data. So one might fit better than the other, and that's totally acceptable. I think that's a really salient point because the the sensing and monitoring world is so conditional <laughs> broadly speaking so it's like a, different solutions are going to be needed across the board for almost every single consideration that you're making thank you for that Absolutely. um our next question you touched on a little bit when you were talking about the exciting new things that xylem is doing but we have a question that says do you have an do any of the songs have Bluetooth capability? And if so, does Xylem have any mobile apps for doing certain types of sampling, like US EPA low flow sam sampling? If not, are there plans to add Bluetooth capability? Yeah, so, so I'll take this one. I actually kind of uh, mentioned this earlier when we we're talking about kind of exciting developments. So, uh, you know, I mentioned the mobile app, um, which does communicate uh, to the instruments via Bluetooth. So. Um, the short answer is yes, the SONs do have Bluetooth built in um, to, in, in order to kind of maintain that Bluetooth uh, connection. Um, once the instrument's submerged, it kind of loses that connection. So the, the Bluetooth built into the SONs are great for um, just kind of surface level, um, if you're just dipping the sensors in the water or if you're um, performing calibrations, uh, that's awesome. We also have another Bluetooth adapter available um, that can be connected to the sound via a field cable. And so while the sound's submerged, if you wanted to do a profile, for example, um, or if you wanted to download your data without actually removing the sound from the water, you can use our Bluetooth adapter then to interface with the sound while it is uh, submerged. Um, and then um, we'll just kind of tease in, in advance. Um, for the iOS um, uh, application that we are working on, a different kind of Bluetooth chip was needed. So we'll be releasing a, uh, an, an updated adapter, an updated Bluetooth adapter that will have compatibility um, for interfacing with uh, iPhones and iPads. The Bluetooth built into the ExoSond currently will not be compatible with just interfacing directly with those instruments, but we will have a Bluetooth adapter available uh, to enable that. Excellent. And would you mind sharing the name of the app 
with us really quickly. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> yeah, when you go on uh, onto the Google Play Store, just search for Core. Um, you know, if you're familiar with our core software program for interfacing with the EXO instruments on a, a Windows PC, um, it's the Core mobile app, and that's spelled K-O-R. Uh, core mobile is what we refer yeah, to. That's what I was going to specify. It's like, make sure it's not the typical spelling of core, but <laughs> yeah, it's, it's K-O-R. Yeah. But if you search Xylem, you might be able to find it as well on my side, but, but core is the name of the application. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and the next question is, is the data from these specific tests uh, publicly available? It is not. We, um, this data, especially this recent um, data set I acquired last year. Um, I'm the only one who has the raw data, and we, this is the first time we're actually um, presenting it publicly, so that's exciting. Um, and then for other tests we've done alongside other brands, um, we have published, I believe, graphs, but um, just showing like the comparison, but, I, but we have not published raw data or anything like that. Thank you. And is there a nitro lead wiper available for the XO1? Unfortunately, no. The XO1 does not have a central port that can accept the central wiper at all. So um, the nitro lead wiper is actually an adapted wiper brush head that fits onto the central wiper. So if you have a central wiper, all you would need is to purchase the um, nitro lead wiper brush. And so it has the regular I mean, you probably saw it in some of the slides we showed earlier, but it has the regular brush head that points down to sweep across the existing sensors. And then it has an extra brush arm that sticks out of the side that will clean through that sensing window particularly. Um, and like I said, it will fit the XO2 and 3 with an existing central wiper, but so same as how we don't have a central wiper for the XO1, they're we do not have a nitro lead wiper for it either. Yeah, I also want to kind of jump in and, and um, highlight something. So right now you can use, um, there's, not, there's nothing preventing users, I guess, from using the nitro lead on an X01, but I would, I would caution those users from doing so just because the nitro lead sensor is extremely um, sensitive it, even even just like little air bubbles that could collect on the lens um, can affect the readings, obviously. So without some form of active anti-fouling, the performance is going to be quite quite limited. So we really just kind of recommend using that sensor on the XO2 and XO3 songs with, with the wiper, as Katie mentioned. So Right, and that will kind of optimize um, your long-term deployment, and like with the data that I presented, um, it really yields stable results. Um, and like I said, we we do recommend monthly calibrations with all of our sensors, but including the nitro lead. Um, but for that deployment, I didn't recalibrate during that whole time. And the, part of the success of that stable um, data collection was because we had the wiper going continuously um, on the EXO during the deployment. Excellent. Um, and our next question is for Zach. Have the WQ sensors been used in ag wetlands environments, especially in enhanced or newly constructed wetlands under the H2 Ohio program? Uh, well, I know we I, I know we definitely have deployed sensors in, in wetlands environments for sure. Um, not off the top of my head, I'm not 100% certain about this, uh, the newly constructed wetlands, not to probably check with our regional rep on that, check with Kyle or Katie, do you know off the top of your head? No, not off the top of my head, but yeah, our regional representatives would probably be tuned into that. All right, and this one is for Katie. Does the test bed pumping station feed river water to a drinking water treatment plant? And if so, do you know the capacity in the towns slash cities served or both? That would be a great question for City of Defiance. Unfortunately, I don't think any of them are on right now. I'm not sure though. Um, yes, the the water that we were had the deployment in was environmental water pumped from the Maumee into their pump house. So I would assume they use it for
drinking water, but I don't know any of their, uh, their specs for, for uh, drinking water users or anything like that. Sorry. <laughs> And our last question is, are there any plans to allow third-party applications to connect to the SOND? Um, not currently, no. Um, but again, we are striving to make, um, as I mentioned before, kind of one of our key strategies is making the data as accessible as possible. So um, by using the either the core software or the handheld or the core mobile app, um, it's a real quick process to get the data from your SOND and export it to a CSV file um, that can then be used, you know, however, you know, however you wish. So, um, but currently no, no plans for um, direct interface with third party applications. I'm assuming that means like for live data, because if we're, if we're talking about telemeter data, we are able to interface the SOND using um, signal output adapters to be able to upload data to a live network via SCADA system with Modbus connection. Um, you can output RS-232, 485, SDI-12. So those would allow you to um, have telemeter data to you know, a third party data logger, things like that. Yeah, actually that's, that's a good distinction. Um, you know, we, we have our own, uh, you know, cloud data hosting platform, Hydrosphere, but we also want to try and make it real easy. We know a lot of customers have their own, um, uh, their own systems. And so we we'll definitely want to try to make it easy. Right. To yeah, we, we, we typically, um, when we offer solutions, telemetered solutions to our customers, um, we are partnering that with our Hydrosphere platform, which is our live data platform. Um, where you can view your sites and uh, download live data. Um, but like with the deployment that we did with uh, City of Defiance and Limnotech, Limnotech had their own site. And so they were able to telemeter data from the EXO um, by adapting the data signal to be able to be uploaded to their site. So yeah, it's a third party software that it interfaces with. Excellent. Um, so if there are no more questions from the audience, I'm going to go ahead and drop my email address in the chat for everyone. This is a very timely uh, webinar because CWA is in the process of launching our 2023 testbed season. So it was a great time to connect with Xylem about their previous testbed deployment and kind of kick off this new season that will be getting in, in late April and May. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions that you might have about participating in the testbed as either a tech host or an innovator looking to deploy. And um, thank you so much to Katie and Zach and Xylem as a whole for participating today. This was a really fruitful conversation, in my opinion, and it seems like there are some really exciting things happening at Xylem, as always. <laughs> um, and I think lastly, there was a question from the audience about uh, Erie Hack and open innovation. Our Eerie Hack programming has evolved into something that we're calling open innovation challenges. They're slightly smaller and more market driven than Eerie Hack was at large. We're in the process of launching a new one. Feel free to connect with me directly with any questions regarding that. And stay tuned for our future innovator showcases where we'll be talking about more exciting technologies that are um, existing in the ecosystem of the testbed. Thanks everybody. And we'll make this recording available to everyone who registered um, for it. So any less thoughts or feelings, <laughs> Katie and Zach? Um, no, I'm just gonna plug my email in the chat in case anyone wants to reach out with more questions as they think of them later on. Excellent. Yeah, just uh, th thanks again for the opportunity. Um, always enjoy working with Cleveland Water Alliance for sure. We had a really successful uh, webinar series partnering with you guys just a few years ago um, that still gets a lot of views uh, on our website. So um, our How Sensors Work series, so that's been yeah. great. Yeah, check out, check out How Sensors Work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was awesome. And like I said, check out the app on the Google Play Store, the, the core app, and uh, be sure to provide any feedback. You know, it's... Uh, 
don't hesitate to reach out. We're always looking for uh, constructive criticism. So awesome. that's how we get And out. our team member from Cleveland Water Alliance, Mallory, also dropped the link to that app in the chat as well if anybody needs um, awesome. quick access to it. So thanks all and have a wonderful rest of the week. And uh, we'll see you again shortly. Bye. Thanks so much, everyone.